Good morning. It is me. Actually, it's good afternoon now. <clears throat> Your humble, friendly neighborhood stroke consultor. Realized I haven't done a video in a couple of days. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, <clears throat> managed to catch a little bit of a sinus cold. And sinus cold post-stroke, not a fun time. The second line is some few things I had to work out on my end. Just, uh, we just brought up today's video, working through the alphabet again. Uh, after a conversation with my brother, um, we're going to do S is for self-advocacy. Yes, that is S is for self-advocacy. Um, so, now this video explicitly is targeted for people like myself that are able to advocate on their own behalf. Um, I'm going to do one advocating on a loved one's behalf. Uh, but this is for people that are able to be their own advocate. You have the ability to communicate either verbally or in written form or picture board. Um, now, let's just consider what a stroke does and how overwhelming it is. Right? A stroke is a malady of the brain and the mind. Uh, it is emotionally impacting. It is physically impacting. Um, a stroke in and of itself, right, it, it is an overwhelming experience. It takes away your self, sense of self-control. In some cases, it takes away your sense of self, right? I've done a video on that. <clears throat> and it's overwhelming. It's life impacting. It's, it's experience shattering. No matter how well you think you may have been prepared for this event, yeah, you're not. Um, I say that with a little bit of expertise and not a lot. I have no major alphabet soup behind my name. Uh, the last job I had in mental health was actually working with acquired and traumatic brain injury patients in their recovery, either uh, just out of hospital, a few in hospital, <clears throat> and generally in their own homes. Right? So, And that was everything from a 12, 13-year-old young man who was in the throes of grades 7 and 8, um, two people in their 20s, 40s, early 30s, right? Um, now, that being said, the bulk of people I was working with were, n n with the exception of the 12-year-old, were not the ability to return back to their former life, being school or work. Uh, so, I thought I would be prepared for this better than I was, having had an experience around people with brain injuries and strokes, and helping them in their life's journey. Get to tell you... Fun fact, unless you've had a stroke, you legitimately have no conceivable idea of what it is and what it's all about. So again, for those of you people that want to try to tell me you know what I have gone through, um, I'm going to direct you to the A is for assholes video. Okay. There's no way you know. Because I even I thought I was fairly educated, fairly knowledgeable, uh, both formally and experientially. And I'll be honest, I'm not. Or at least wasn't. So, self-advocacy. Right? And this this video is specifically targeted for the people that have the ability to communicate on their own behalf about their experience, about the experience that they have been having, <clears throat> and about the experience they need or want to have. So, self-advocacy self places you back in the driver's seat. Right? Um, it puts you in control. Right? Uh, it puts you in a position where you're now ready to find the obstacles and, and bypass them and just breach them and get around them and do what you need to do, right? Um, now, that being said, as soon as you decide to be a self-advocate, the onus is now upon you to maintain the momentum, right? If you've decided to pick up and run with that ball, you just can't drop it. Because... You've had a stroke, and again, I'm going to leave links for the research I've done about this. Uh, because you've had a stroke, and that has robbed you um, of your dignity, right? Um, of your privacy, um, of you know your ability to make decisions at times, um, the ability to trust yourself at times, um, right? So, when it comes down to being an advocate upon your own behalf, <clears throat> part of that is advocating for resources that you will need, right? Be that um, physiotherapy, be that speech and language, be that occupational therapy, be that you need some kind of mobility device incorporated in your world, be it a cane, a scooter, a walker, 
um, be that a support animal, which I'm still considering cane a support animal. There may be days where I might need a cane. I'm mainly for stability because um, I still have balance issues. Support animal, still debating that. So, um, you then have to look at other things like, do I need a new eye exam? Because I've had a stroke and I think it's impacted my eyes or my vision. Do I need a specialist eye exam, an eye doctor that deals specifically with brain neurology after a brain injury and stroke? Right? Um, are you looking for a specialized occupational therapist that deals specifically with return to work planning for people that have had brain injury or stroke, right? Um, and again, you want to make the decisions about, or, or even a counselor, right? Um, because again, it's a fairly emotionally traumatic experience. You're going to want to find counseling. Fun fact. Um, now then, uh, I have currently had a speech and language pathologist. I no longer need him. I have had an occupational therapist. I may have one more assessment visit before that is over with. I currently still have a physiotherapist and I have a counselor, right? What I've done for myself is now, again, if you're not in Canada or a place that has national health care, um, you're not going to understand this one. I called the OHIP office. That's the Ontario Health Insurance Plan office because my general practitioner, family doctor, was not aware of how I could get OHIP to pay for a new eye exam. Or if they would, he didn't know. He told me to talk to my eye doctor. And I'm like, oh. So I called OHIP. OHIP said, as long as my family doctor will sign off on that, which he's going to, because I'm going to tell him to, um, they'll pay for it. So I just need him to write a referral note saying, I need an eye exam due to stroke. And OHIP will pay for it, provided I give that note to the eye doctor. That problem is solved. Um, insofar as new prescription, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it or put dirt under the bridge while I'm crossing it. I don't know which will happen first. Um, when it comes to, <clears throat> uh, I found out there is an eye doctor not too far from me that apparently deals with brain injury and stroke. So I'm gonna get their contact information and see if they will be the eye doctor that will do the exam on me, right? Um, and, and go for it from there. Another thing, um, you need to be on top of paperwork and there's going to be lots of it um so for example i had to do a because i had my stroke at work i had to do a workman or workplace health and safety form through the province of ontario because i had my stroke at work um, i had to do my unemployment forms um, when i got initially injured and, and that's how i was getting short term i had to do the long-term disability uh, for my place of employment, uh, for the insurance through them. And then I gave that to my employer about two weeks ago, called the insurance company to, to just have a conversation with them because even though my workplace health claim will not actually become active until the middle of October, I wanted to make sure the paperwork was in and the process was going on. I found out work hadn't faxed it. Um, so I just did it, right? Um, I have all the originals and I'm like, I need to be able to have conversations with the insurance company before that date. I need to make sure that you're not missing any paperwork. I need to make sure if you are missing paperwork and I can get it to you. I need to make sure that I'm not in a pay gap where, you know, the short term is ending uh, and has ended. And then the long term is waiting for some administrative or logistical process to finish up. And because I intend to go back to work sometime around the end of December. I need to make sure that I have access to a occupational therapist before December so I can have a sit down with them, me, uh, figure out what type of modifications I may need, uh, and then go back to any other professional appointments like neurologist, GP, um, eye doctor, whatever, right? And so that way I can have a, a definitive plan in place with my employer about <clears throat> what the hours I'll be working when I go back initially, because my ultimate goal is to go back to a normal 40 hour work week. I appreciate that's not gonna be a realistic thing when I go back. <clears throat> so I need I need 
an occupational report, uh, basically to help substantiate and create a plan with my employer. So that way everyone's on the exact same page, right? And that's just part of the self-advocacy. I know I'm going to need this, right? Um, and because of that, um, I have to have some people that have some professional skill and ability that I, I don't possess um, to be able to provide everyone, including me, the benchmarks, right? In the first week, I'll be working four hours every other day. On the next week, I'm going to work four hours every day. On the next week, I'm going to work four hours, you know, and then three days that week, and then I'm going to work six hours, two days that week, right? Or whatever that may, I, that might even be, I'm going to work four hours every other day for two weeks. You know, uh, it might require extra breaks. Um, due to light sensitivity. It might require me to wear sunglasses indoors. It might require me to wear a hat. Um, it might require me to do whatever. Um, you know, um, I might require a service animal. I, I honestly don't know. I'm not saying I will. I'm not saying I won't. I'm just saying what if, right? Um, so there's many things you need to be prepared to do as part of your self-advocacy, right? Remember, you had the stroke and you have the ability to communicate with, for, and about yourself. So, there's a couple of things here. One, you're gonna wanna keep a diary or notebook handy. Well, one, you've had a stroke, your memory might be shot. So, so writing things down will now become your, your new normal for helping memorize things or, or maintain your memory, right? Um, secondly, any questions you may have about your recovery and its journey, any thoughts or concerns, you can write those down as well, right? Um, and then that, with having your notebook handy and writing down your questions, thoughts, or concerns, you can now start to create to-do lists. I need to do the following three things. And for thing number one, I got to call my doctor, and I need to get a referral from my doctor, and then I got to call the eye doctor due to the referral or a neurologist due to the referral or whatever due to the referral. I went to my neurologist and I had a series of issues that I needed to speak with them about and I was looking about a specific medication. So I want to talk to my neurologist about this medication. Um, and then, for my case, I wanted to call OHIP about eyeglasses. OHIP said, yes, they'll cover the eye appointment. They won't cover glasses though. I called my EAP plan to find out about an occupational therapist. They said, you have to call your insurance company. So I called my insurance company, found out the paperwork wasn't there yet and went, you know what? I need to have these conversations. I'm just going to do it. And that's being a self-advocate, right? Um, I'm really unconcerned about how you perceive me being my own advocate. And you as the fellow stroke assaulter also don't need to worry about other people's perceptions or concerns they're irrelevant, right? They are completely, totally, wholeheartedly irrelevant, right? It's not your, it's not their life, right? If they get their hackles up because they think, you know, you're being difficult, yeah, I am. I want my life back, right? You want your life back, right? The only way I'm going to get my life back, the only way you are going to get your life back is fortune favors the bold, right? So you're going to have to do things to get things done. If that means you're stepping on people's backs, well, wear soft shoes, right? Now, once you have your list of thoughts and concerns, place your questions in an order of importance, right? Uh, so obviously the more urgent concepts will get dealt with first, or is it just first in, first out, right? Um, you know, if, if they all have relatively the same urgency, just pick down the list. Things have more urgency, like it comes to financial planning or funding for things, or where am I going to find that doctor at, right? Now, got to be patient because sometimes you're going to have to call multiple people to get the right answer. So I spoke to my GP in person figuring, well, you're a doctor, you would know. No, they didn't. So I figured, you know what, I'm not going to go and talk to the eye doctor to be told no. 
I will just go call my health care provider, that being the province of Ontario, and said, hey, I had a stroke. I'm outside the age ranges to have medically covered eye examinations. Will OHIP cover an eye exam? They said yes, provided I get a referral. Guess what? My doctor's going to give me a referral. Right? Now then, secondly, because you may have to go from one person to the next to the next, to get the correct answer, you need to be patient with the experience, right? And not get overly frustrated when people don't know what you need to know when you think they should know it. Because I was kind of concerned when I got the answer from my GP and I kind of went, eh, okay. And on my way out the door, I'm like, idiot, I'll just call OHIP, right? And that's what I did, right? OHIP gave you the right answer. Now I'm just going to call the eye doctor and just make sure everything's set up and we'll go from there. But first I'm going to call the eye doctor in the other city to see if they will do what I need. Right? And if you need to start a conversation with someone, right, um, make sure that they have the time to invest in that conversation. Now, obviously, if you've made an appointment with the healthcare practitioner or doctor or occupational therapist or physiotherapist, right? If you've already booked an appointment, we can make the assumption that they're going to have the time. Or they might tell you, hey, listen, let's do the assessment for that now, and then we'll book another appointment and we can talk about what the assessment says. Either way, they're going to give you the time. So if you have to book professional appointments, just be concerned. You may not get the answers on the first appointment. It may take one or two appointments for them to do the assessment to give you the information you need, or they may have to order tests, right? So one thing you can do for self-advocacy is be effective in your communication, right? So you need to be concrete, you need to be clear, you need to be concise, and you need to be congruent, right? So you have to be concrete in your language. I need exactly this from you for the following reasons, right? You need to be using clear language, easily understood, no room for ambiguity, right? It's got to be concise. As I say at work, try to land the plane, right? Um, do it in 200 words or less, right? Preferably less. And then congruent. You need to just, you need not only for them to display with you congruence, because my brain still doesn't have the ability to handle incongruent thoughts just randomly being thrown down range. Um, so you need to be congruent with them as well, right? Most importantly, when you're communicating, don't say sorry, right? Let me say that again for those in the back that missed it. Um, when you need something from someone because of your stroke, do not say sorry. It's like, hey, listen, we need to talk. You know that thing? Yeah, no. Or... I need this from you for me for the following reason, right? And if they can't do it, soft shoes right over their back. I'm, I'm okay with walking on backs right now um, because I don't care, right? Um, now, with healthcare practitioners, you might end up in a bit of a bit of a sticky wicket because some healthcare practitioners may be too self-involved, and I've had to deal this. Um, great thing about a healthcare practitioner, you have a college. Yes, you have a college. So if you end up in a difficult situation with a healthcare practitioner, simply look at them and say, I need your college number, please, and I will see you at the college. Typically gets their attention really quickly. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes, I'm doing that, by the way. Um, there is currently a nurse and a doctor from two different facilities that currently have college issues because of me. Or not because of me, no. Because of their deportment and lack of advocacy and being an effective provider in healthcare to me, uh, for me. So, yeah, they're currently dealing with the college. Fun times. Right? <clears throat> and then, lastly... If you're going to be a self-advocate, right, 
just remember you're going to encounter people that are not on your side, right? So if it comes down to where you're truly not getting what you need, right? One, don't feel guilty. This is not your problem. It is theirs. They're a horrible human, right? They're a full on horrible human, right? Remember, you are your own expert, right? I'm not expecting you to understand what I've been through. And please don't say that you have the ability to understand what I'm going through because you legitimately don't. What I'm going to say is this. You're the expert of what's going on in your life because of your stroke. They're not, right? Um, however, it's important they understand what is going on with and around you and what is in the next best steps for you and how and why they're important to you, right? Um, don't feel guilty, right? You have every single right to every available option. At least in province Ontario, healthcare is free. I have a right to healthcare, right? Um, and you have a human right. Human rights tribunal people, they're fun people. So when you're working with a service provider, whoever that is, right? Be it your insurance company, EAP, physiotherapist, speech and language path, counselor, you know, psychologist, neurologist, doctor, whatever, right? When I come to a specific healthcare provider, whatever they may be, when I approach a specific organization, whoever that may be, I'm looking to get an answer from you. It's their job to provide the answer, right? Keep in mind, you may end up encountering people that are not as educated, so you may have to call back, right? Or ask for a supervisor. Um, don't get upset with them, right? You, you may be asking very specific questions they've never heard before. Right? They've legitimately never heard before. When I called OHIP, the first person I got transferred me to somewhere I have no idea. So I hung up and called back. That next person gave me the answer straight away. Didn't have to transfer me. I'm like, oh, moving on. Perfect. Right? It will be frustrating when dealing with people on the phone or in person when you're apparently not getting the answers that you're asking an obvious question. Right? It, it expects a specific response that would appear to be obvious. When you're dealing with the situations where you're expecting the obvious answer, but the numpty on the other end of that conversation is a thief of air, a waste of rations, and a bag of skin that's learned to walk upright and talk, stay calm. Just as best you can, stay calm. Worst case scenario, disengage from the conversation, tell them you'll be back to talk about it later because you're just too frustrated, right? And again, <clears throat> if you have to deal with specific individuals, um, like such as at work, right? Um, make an appointment. I need to speak with you and I need a half an hour of your time. Okay. Uh, let's make an appointment. When it comes to your physiotherapist, when it comes to your, um, speech and language path, when it comes to your neurologist, right? If you have an ongoing repetitive appointment, you can make time during that appointment and go, Hey, I need to discuss this with you. Generally speaking, in my experience, I've had no problem at all. No problem at all. Um, however, they may ask you to book another appointment just to deal with that situation. Right? Uh, may, maybe like, well, hey, listen, I'd love to discuss it, but I need tests first. So there's a lot of aspects in there when it comes to being your own self-advocate. But remember, if you're going to pick up the ball, if you drop it, things will fall apart. So if you choose to be your own self-advocate, you've got to maintain the momentum at all costs. You may need to lean on a few people from time to time, but there's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, you are the expert about your own situation, right? No one can tell you how impacting your stroke is because they have no idea, legitimately no idea. And when you go with being your self-advocate, right, that also means you may need to change service providers, right? you know what, I don't like that neurologist, or I don't like that eye doctor, or I don't like my GP, uh, it's right now not a good fit. I need a... And you have the right to ask for a new doctor, a new physiotherapist, a new speech and language path. Luckily, everyone I've encountered with, through that I've had ongoing appointments with have been absolutely amazing, completely brilliant, right? That being said, um, always be appreciative, right? Don't forget the little acts of kindness. Hey, thanks for your time. You know what? Um, if it's someone you have an ongoing standing appointment with, right? 
be appreciative for everything they've done with and for you because they're some of the most amazing people you're ever going to get to meet. Um, and how they do what they do, I, I don't know. But for my, my physiotherapist and my counselor specifically, they're amazing people, right? And I, I can't thank them enough. But that being said, we're going to end off with S today. S is for self-advocacy. So if you happen to see either anyone around you that's currently through the throes of a stroke, stroke recovery, um, they're either in the hospital, gone to rehab, they're at home, whatever the case may be. You know someone who, whose family member has recently had a stroke. Please recommend the channel to them. Like, subscribe, hit the little bell thing to get immediate notifications. Leave comments down below or you can email me at strokeassaulter at gmail.com. I say again, strokeassaulter at gmail.com. If you have any questions, I'll happily answer them or some content you want to see me cover. And if you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you the signs or symptoms of a stroke, that being facial droop, inability to raise both arms equally effectively or at all, slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context, inability to, to smile equally appropriately or at all, uh, inability to stand unaided, general body weakness or weakness on one side, please <clears throat> immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.